No, that's okay. Is my voice clearly coming over? Excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, so I was given an hour slot. I was asked to give at least some questions for Q&A. We'll see if that actually happens. Um, so I thank you all for coming here, especially during your work day, even the lunch day. I do know that it's a little hard to get away to, to watch something. I'll try to be as entertaining and weird as possible. Um, if you have any questions, of course, I'll stick around afterwards. I'm happy to talk about the things I talk about. Um, I will ask in a weird way, how many people here know what I'm about? And not, okay, two. And how many are here just because, ah, the description was interesting? Okay. And how many people are here because of some sort of, you can put your hand up really quickly and down, some sort of compelling force? that made it clear that you should probably stop by. Okay, so that's, so that's good. All right, good. It's always important to understand your audience. So I have primary, you know, except for of course the ghost dogs in a thousand years who will find this desiccated SD card and make it live again and be like, this was important to the humans back then. Um, but everybody else, you know. So, so this is called basically the race to undelete history and it's about a whole bunch of different projects that I'm involved in. And I'll explain where I come from, what I'm up to, and um, I'm here for an event that Dagan and I are both attending, and he said, hey, if you can come an extra day early, maybe it would be nice for you to stop by work and talk about things. Um, I've been many different weird things in my life. Each one of these is an odd story, um, but um, as life has gone on, you become known for things, then stuff goes away, and that's just kind of how it works. But these days, I am primarily known as the Angel of Death, and it's a great title. looks good on a business card. And the reason I'm called the Angel of Death is because I am involved in the archiving of websites. And so people know that if I show up or start talking about a website, time to run, time to get out of the way. Something is going to go wrong because what I do is I work for a, a place and the place is the Internet Archive, which is located in San Francisco, although technically it's located in the Internet. And it's located in this insane building which my boss bought because it looked like his logo, which is always a really good way to go about things. <laughs> so this was a Christian science church until 1999, and then my boss bought it. It is now a hybrid data center and business office, and technically still uh, sort of has a chapel in it, although it was deconsecrated, which was an interesting process. This is my boss. His name is Brewster Kale. He was a... Um, dot-com millionaire a couple times over. He created what some people might think if they, they might know if they go back, something called WACE, the Wide Area Information Service, and he also was involved in Alexa Internet that was also sold to Amazon for a lot of money, which he then had. So he had a lot of money. So when you become a very, very rich person, you can do one of two things. You can discover exactly how expensive some food is and begin sailing around the world. Or you can have some sort of altruistic dream and work forward from it. And he happened to go for the second. And the reason he uh, bought this building was because his dream as a child was to bring back the Library of Alexandria. He had loved books, and he had learned about the story of Alexandria burning down, and he's like, I want to bring that back again. So this is his implementation of his dream, and to which I am now absorbed into as well. Um, the Internet Archive's webpage used to look like this at archive.org. Now it actually looks like this. Um, and a lot of people know us as the Wayback Machine. We're that thing you use to embarrass your boss. And we're that thing that lets you prove that this once was this way or, or to find a story that's long gone or a piece of research that's gone. It crawls the Internet every day by the millions and then keeps track of them and lets you go back to a given site and see how it existed going back as far as two th uh, 1996. And um, it also has a whole bunch of other material, too. It's got movies, it's got music, it's got books and software, and you can browse literally. There, we have something on the order of four million digitized books. Every day we digitize four million books, uh, sorry, 1,000 books. Um, so we're, we're kind of like this idea of like, what would happen if we put a big library on the internet? Inside, it gets a little weird. Um, this is one, the, the, the main great room, great place to have meetings. And in the back there, you go, well, what's that? And the answer is yes, those are in fact data servers. Um, inside each of side, we have little figurines of people. Um, they're even creepier at night. Um, and I have a tweet that says, what's up with the creepy statues? That's like the first thing I said I ever walked in. And the creepy statues are, if you work at the Internet Archive for three years, they make a little statue of you. It's a whimsical place. This is actually what mine looks like. And so um, 
and he's clutching some software to his heart, and that's very cute. In the background, we have these um, servers. Each one of these holds one petabyte of information um, and is accessed by a few million people a day uh, acquiring different things. Uh, they're really neat. They're completely commodity hardware because they constantly have disks dying and we're always sending a pallet out, getting a new pallet, you know, keeping what's currently 21 petabytes of data going every day uh, under extremely sho uh, shoestring budget. That's kind of like what our big mission is. Our first and foremost thing is getting information out there we don't want to spend, you know, $50 million on a data center that looks good in pictures. It's like, I mean, this looks good in pictures, but only in this really weird off-quirk way. It makes a lot of data center managers look at it and they're like, where's the ventilation? The answer is the ceiling. And we suck the heat away from them and use them to heat the building. So it's one of those deals. I like the intersection of old and new, though. Like, here's a guy using a boombox that I saw in Sweden uh, to play stuff off the MP3 in this store that sold Scape. I just love the old stuff, right? Like, here's a warning from 1896 about infringing the trademark of corn harvesters. And the Corn Harvesters Association stepping forward to let you know that piracy of their corn harvesters will not be tolerated. So if you're like, wow, you mean there was a corn harvester bay? And the answer is probably. Um, I love things like this very old uh, court case from 2000, at which point this person said, I went to Google, G-O-O-G-L-E. And the fact that today you would never spell Google ever. It's become a part of the language. The old and the new. In terms of the new, um, there's a lot of activity, especially in the past five or six years in the second Gilded Age that we're experiencing, of startups. And startups want to have a big splash. And so you get all of this idea of it being a party. There's going to be a party. And um, the thing about parties is that parties don't last, right? And you have a lot of websites that are like, come on, come join our party. Come put your data with us. Come give us things. And parties aren't homes, right? They're just these temporary fun things. And so I deal with the end of the party. And the ends of the parties, like most parties, are never pretty. They're very weird. They're very awkward, right? You'll ha it'll come in the form of an announcement. There'll be that trip advisor acquires Wanderfly. And the rest of this is <laughs> But trip advisor acquires Wanderfly. And then just a few months later, Wanderfly, guess what happened? I'm sorry to say Wanderfly has moved on. We had a wonderful time with you. All your data is gone. Thank you. Ancestry and 1,000 memories combined. So 1,000 Memories was acquired by Ancestry.com. And then a few months later, goodbye. <laughs> and I love this one because it's got a little cat looking into the road ahead as if to say, here's the road you're hitting. And it was particularly problematic because it was a whole bunch of family data, like ancestral data that they had acquired. And they were like, that's gone. So you have during the next month, you can export your photos or download them, but then we'll delete them permanently. One of my favorite phrases. Like they're literally taking each hard drive and just shoving it into a grinder, never to be found again. But this is the language, you, you say it's permanently because legally you don't want any situation where people could ever claim that they could ever get it back again. And it's this weird approach to that. We're so excited to announce that you're gone. We are excited to announce that Yahoo has acquired bread, which itself is a good sign of the times. Um, so after a while, you start to realize that we are excited to announce Yahoo has acquired it us is like saying they found a lump. It's just one of these things of like, oh, man, what are we going to do? And a lot of them will use the phrase of an incredible journey. Like they'll say, we were on this incredible journey with you and now it's just us and you are by the side of the road. So the reason for that is because the internet um, started up a long time ago. Here's the first computer that they were playing Space War on. 
and here's the guy who programmed Space War in 1961, and here's me. You can go to a place and touch this guy. I think that's great. I mean, I'm not doing the hover hand. I'm doing the full touch. Steve Slug Russell, he'll come and he'll kick your butt in Space War at the Computer History Museum on Saturdays. The fact is, is the industry is very young. Computers are very young. The fact that you can still talk to the caveman who slammed rocks together while you're walking around in your Segway is amazing. I mean, and, and I think that's really amazing. Yet, along with it came the fact that a lot of the, what we think of as the internet is really kind of like this weird experiment, this weird idea of like, whoa, it works, we're done here. You know, just like a maker experiment gone and writ large, right? You start out with like this ancient history that is less than a, a decade or a couple decades old, one generation old, and you're able to look at it and go like, what were we even thinking? And yet this is so recent in terms of things, right? Here's the first e-commerce site. This is the first one. This is what it looked like. This is where all the crap came from. You would type in your name and your phone number and they would call you and deliver a pizza. But they're the first one. Um, it was brought to you by Pizza Hut and the Santa Cruz operation. And by that, they mean that they borrowed a Unix box. <laughs> it was a thing. And so from that, everything starts to go weird, right? You start to get all sorts of people jumping on the internet. And again, you go from a few million people at various institutions to things being crazy even by 2001. And as we know, it's already up to billions. And along that way, we didn't develop any practices. We just kind of figured out ways to piss each other off the least. Um, you know, we had all sorts of sites like GeoCities that would start up and allow everyone to attach things to it and then they would just delete them because there were no data retention policies, there was no ending services. I mean, if you're gonna go outside and you find your car's been towed, your first thought isn't, well, that's my car. Because you know that it's gonna be hauled to the outskirts of town, there's gonna be some cancerous person behind a, uh, a little voo smoking away, looking at you going like, it's gonna be $300, and you're gonna find out that's not even for the ticket, it's just the fee, and you're angry, and your date's ruined, but you know your car is gonna come back to you, because there's at least a base set of, nothing like that with websites. They will say, I have had shut down amounts from one year to it's already gone, with a lot of them being 30 days. It'll be 30 days, and these are sites that'll be up for 14 years. And they'll be like, hope you're still checking your Hotmail account because big news is afoot. An incredible journey has begun. This, believe it or not, is the GeoCities data center cage from 1999. This allows a full nine terabytes of data to be held and allow them to use all their users. I mean, you know, this stuff is, again, this one's only 15 years ago, and this was nine terabytes. Nine terabytes, of course, is now about 200 bucks. 300 if you want to make sure it's got some extra feature. But then it was just ruinous, the amount of work they had to do. And they deleted it extreme, extremely quickly. So, you know, there's, there's tragedies like Tableau. And Tableau was a very interesting project where it was, you would put up pictures and then tell a story. A Tableau. And then it was purchased by HP. And then HP bought another printer service and then left these two in a room with a pool cue and said, we'll be back in an hour. We will hire the survivor. The survivor was not Tableau. Um, this particular story came very recently, you know, towards the end of it, and this is a guy with pictures of his house burning down. And in it, he says at the bottom, yeah, my house burned to the ground, I lost everything, and I lost all my pictures. Luckily, they're all on Tableau. And then two months later, Tableau deleted all his pictures. So this is the world we live in. Um, so I actually got involved in a project a few years ago before the Internet Archive, and that project um, was to find ways to get old data and put it together. Because I'm trying to get away from a world where we lose websites, right? Because um, I loved old technology. I mean, I've loved it since I was a kid. This is me at 11 in front of the Apple office because I made my dad pull over so I could pose next to it, right? We love old technology. It becomes part of us. These things are not just minor, meaningless items, right? This is, a, this, this is meaningful to me on two occasions. Uh, one is that this guy, like a, like a school fan, wrote all of the logos of these early 1980s computer companies. And then, as is evidenced by the keyboard, 
kept it for 30 years. So it's meaningful then, and it's meaningful now, right? And I agree, everything burns. I will not disagree with that, right? Uh, this is the um, archive.org book scanning center that was in the reading room of the church that we took over, where we would be scanning books and scanning materials. Uh, there's a picture of me posing with Aaron Swartz behind the building. I th we lost Aaron Swartz about two, three years ago. Um, I thought that that was the lost part, but it turned out both are. This is one of the last photos of that reading room because it burned. So <laughs> there was a fire and we lost the reading room. It looked like that afterwards. And it was weird because my boss was interviewed at four in the morning and they talked about how he seemed strangely excited. And they didn't understand him. And the reason why is because he's a classic case of, oh, it's burned down. I'm gonna build something even better. I'm gonna make it like that was even cooler. I, I, every day he's told that what he does is impossible, that he can't put all these things online, that we can't save these old web pages. So he was excited. So this has actually been demolished and he's going to build an institute there and have researchers come in and have it have be mixed use. And so everything to him. And so I really pull energy from this guy because of that, right? Um, I'm looking for a world where at least we get the option of deciding to keep our old data as a rule. Um, of course people want to have the right to be forgotten. Of course people want stuff to go away. Um, you know, in an ideal world, I walk away and I don't bother anybody. This is me on the streets of Belfast. That was very appreciated. Um, I spoke at an event as the angel of death, which is where that all came from. Anyway, so as, as, a, as a general rule, I've been involved in projects like something called Archive Team, which is a set of activist archivists that will jump into a site, download as much of it as possible, and run before it closes. And it's both inspiring that we have hundreds of volunteers to do this, and you're welcome to join anytime, but it's also really annoying that we have to do that, that we have to be these weird EMTs. And believe me, we get messages every day from people about websites that went down two years ago who were like, I went and checked my site and it's down, and I heard you might have a copy. Especially young mothers, it turns out. Young mothers are very busy, and they don't really have time to check their full social media portfolio while they're raising a child. And they'll be like, where's my baby photos? And now, of course, a person can say as an engineer, well, you should have been backing it up, lady. You should have had a full uh, you know, regimen of keeping track of your data. And to me, that's like walking to a car accident and saying, I would have worn my seatbelt. Like, you're not really helping in that way, right? You're just kind of telling people what you would do that's better. So. Um, this is one of these projects that I've been involved in for the Internet Archive and bringing in data um, now for four years that I've been working for these guys. And it's a very proud thing. And, and the thing is, is as you work at different companies, you will find yourself in some meeting. And it's a very important meeting and you won't know it's an important meeting because you'll be on one end of the table talking and listening to people talk and then somebody will start to hit that point where they will work with user data. And you might not even recognize that it's user data. Like it'll be like, yeah, da, 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 they can save some bookmarks. Or yeah, a person can enter their own comments or whatever. And you need to realize that that is in an ideal world and entrusting of people's culture and lives with you. And that in the far, you know, in the, in the far reaches of as things go forward, there will come a time when that data will be at risk simply because it will be changed. I mean, going from version 1.0 to 2.0 of everything leaves things pulled away, the ability to remove things, right? And so my hope is that maybe one of you will say just enough or something to go like, well, why don't we add an export function? Or maybe a person can just list out what they have, you know, press a button. Um, there was an activist named um, Brian Fitzpatrick at Google and he created a group called the Google Data Liberation Front. And they're the ones who created what's known as Google Takeout. And if you've ever seen it, you basically go to Google Takeout and it tells you every Google service that has your personal data on it and lets you pull a zip out. A zip that 99% of the people in the world will have trouble reading, but it's there. At the very least, it's there. You know, it's one thing to go, uh, to me, it's better to have a situation where you're like, I have a zip file, I don't quite know if it's any use, but I have it, 
then I have nothing and no evidence I ever existed. So I'm going to go with, of these two buckets of chum, I'm going to drink from this one, just because, all right, that's where we're going to get. Um, Dragon asked me to like, talk about um, the other project that I'm working on. So I'm going to switch over to that, so I'm going to swi just switch gears. So I'm happy to talk about the Internet Archive, about our mission, about everything we do, um, but I'm also going to talk about software, because besides being the angel of death, I'm also the software curator for the Internet Archive. And the reason for that is when Brewster hired me, he said, we do, we do books so well. We do movies, we do these websites, but we really fell down on software. What can you do about software? Can you make it playable? Can you interact with things? And I said, yes, sir. I'll get right on it. And it only took three years and 20 volunteers, but I did it. So I just want to talk about what that exactly was, right? Which is I have a very soft spot for old things that are in the software business. Like this is a bunch of Atari 800, 8-bit stuff from early 1980s, and each one of these has a certain kind of meaning to people, right? When you look at the stuff, you can say, oh, this is an Atari ST, and it did this, but this is primarily the way you interact with it now. Somebody at a festival shows up and has a table, and you go over and you go, oh, yeah, it's old. Oh, man, that's plastic and old. Oh, this is cardboard and old. Hey, this is a story about how it's old. And that's about it, and if you're lucky, they'll boot something up for you. But it's very much a case of you have to travel to it. And that's very similar to an old day when you would have to go to the Abbey to read the books instead of having books accessible to you. You'd have to go down to the castle and hopefully get a book. And libraries changed all that. And the idea is libraries should do that too, right? So first thing I did was I went out and I got a bunch of software. So the archive, the Internet Archive at this point has terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of software. Largest collection on the web, period. Find me a bigger one and I'll download it and add it to us. Okay? So, without question, I went out and I've imaged thousands of ISOs, I've imaged tons of floppy disks, I've, I've pulled down every FTP site we can find because FTP sites are on the way out. Um, we found every mirror that we can of software collections. We've got a lot of software, and that's nice. But the problem with software is that it's not just a matter of going, yay, it's been collected, trust us. Um, it needs to be accessed, because access drives preservation. That's one of the, the credos I learned from my boss, which was that people, if you say to someone, yeah, there's a building you can't go to, and there's 2,000 Picassos there, and they're in good shape, you may or may not be inclined to donate, you may or may not be inclined to share, but if a person provides a way for you to press a button and a Picasso shows up, either in person or through a rotating exhibit, or for you to request access to it, or if even better yet, a digital form that lets you get 90% of the information you want to about it by witnessing it in a really nice way, you're more likely to treat it well or, or to regard that it's got importance. Because the hardest part about getting people to understand history is to make sure they're there when it happens and that they save it. Otherwise, they don't, right? I mean, um, uh, I gave a talk at a game convention where I said the future of game history is to steal from work. And the reason why is because that's the only way, like a lot of game companies just destroy their stuff after like 30 days. And they'll take the machine that helped build Gates of War 35 and they'll just format it and work on Gates of War 36. So it's just, you know, there's a, there's a lack of, you have to first accept that maybe software has meaning as history. And I can debate that with you, but I think it does. Um, but it's no good to have just a big fat pile because people are going to be like, yeah, that's nice. You have a zip file that's 16 terabytes. Oh, great. Thank you, person. So the future is going to probably be emulators. The ability of programs to run older programs and emulate what they do such that some analog of that experience happens. And a lot of people know this emulator, the MAME emulator, which enables you to play arcade games. And if you've ever been on a friend's computer, or on your own computer, not officially, of course, not in this room, um, and Pac-Man is playing, it's probably MAME. It's probably this emulator that was started in 1998 by an Italian named Nicola Samora, who created a framework for emulating Pac-Man, initially. Um, but it grew. It grew and it grew and it grew. And now it emulates 31,000 different arcade games. And the reason it can is because it rephrased arcade machines of instead of emulating arcade machines, let's emulate chips. 
and then let's define every arcade machine as a collection of chips. So, oh, it's got this AY chip, it's got this 6502, that's Popeye, that's, you know, Altered Beast. And that's nice. But of course, arcade games are debatable about, you know, history and so on. I think they're very important, but I can understand whether people are going like, oh, I don't know. Um, there's been all this stuff where people have created support programs for it. So you get these ability to look at, you know, all the metadata around arcade games and everything else. And that's fantastic. But then somebody said, well, since we're just emulating sets of chips, why just stop at arcade games? Why not just do every machine that has chips? And that led to the multi-emulator super system. And the multi-emulator super system emulates 1,600 different computer platforms. And it emulates everything from Apple IIs, Apple IIIs, Apple 7000s. And then it's able to emulate, it emulates a, um, a machine that they only made 100 of in New Zealand. Um, they emulate um, a synthesizer. They emulate Simon speaking spells. They emulate, um, you know, machines up to the mid 2000s. They emulate Game Boys, they emulate consoles, game consoles. And I was like, that's it. We should support that. But the problem is, is it's like buying a boat. You download the emulator, and then you have to go download all the ROMs, and then you have to download the support files, each time having to click through 400 ads. Um, and if you're lucky, you get it all working. But that's not where, that's not where happiness happens, you know? Happiness is where a person says, I want you to see this crazy old thing, and a person clicks on it and goes, that is an old thing. Because that's what we do with movie and music now, right? You say to your friend, oh, I have this recording of the Beatles messing up a performance. And they're like, really? And you give them a, a YouTube link and you hear it and they're like, oh, you're right. Your first response isn't, oh my God, my computer is playing music. Holy crap. And you don't like show them another thing going like, this is in high definition. Oh my God, in a window. How did you, ah, eh. Like you, you, it's so much a part of our lexicon now that the, the period from Dave Grohl, thinking of Dave Grohl, what does he look like right now, to I'm looking at Dave Grohl right now, is zero. You can just be there. And we've just grown used to that. But we've done it with texts and movies and music, but we didn't do it with software. And that's fine. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons, both political and legal and you know technical, that they haven't done that. But this thing came out. And this thing is a terrible hack. And this is a technical audience. So I will tell you that this is a end-level compiler to turn C and C++ into JavaScript, which is terrible. That is a terrible thing. That is a terrible solution. That is like building a suitcase out of a pet. It'll work, but you're not going to like it. Don't look too close. <laughs> so it will compile Emscripten. Emscripten will turn it into a working JavaScript. And JavaScript is the secret crappy language that was not bought by Larry Ellison and ruined, and sits in all browsers and functions to some level very well. It's, it's actually really great the way it's been done, and it's been enhanced and is faster. And there have been advancements in how it's done. So my thought was, OK, let's try to make it so that these people are working on mess and maim. And bear in mind, they're doing between 100 and 200 bug fixes a month on mess and maim. They're adding all sorts of new features. They're adding all sorts of bug fixes, optimizations, realizations. Let them do that work. Let the emulator exist over here. Let's try to come up with a way to make it go into all the browsers. Because um, the way to reach the most people right now is through a browser, because a browser is generally in every machine. JavaScript is the one language that they all have built in, so there's no plug-in. And then let's use this really world-class emulator and you put them all together and you end up with the JavaScript mess, which is what I call it. And the JavaScript mess is a JavaScript porting of MAME and mess. So what that means is I have a world where we can put all the computers into your browser. And that sounds weird, but it works. You can just kind of boot up everything from Macintoshes and ColecoVisions and Odyssey 2s and um, Atari 800s into a window on your browser, pulling from a piece of software. Um, we have since moved it into a larger framework, and this framework is called the emularity. And the emularity is basically, it allows it to do multiple 
um, emulators. So there's now Mess, there's MAME, there's another one called MDOS Box, there's another one um, called uh, JIT, and all of them do certain platforms or types really well. So the emularity is a way of calling those into your browser. That we just, everything on the whole line is, is open source. So if you go to the Internet Arcade and you go there, there's a bunch of video games. And you click on a video game and you are playing that video game. And you've got a question in your mind. The answer is when I first put it up, it had 1,100 games. It currently has 636. But they are 636. That's a good afternoon. And people are able to go to it and try these programs out, and they have by the hundreds of thousands, um, and be able to say, oh, look at this terrible thing. And I will, I will contend that there are some games that this year have had more plays than they ever had in their entire history at the time that they ran. You can go to a place like Frenzy, which was the sequel to the game Berserk, and click on that button, and now you're playing Frenzy. <laughs> and it's there. It's just running. And so it turns all of computer history into an embeddable object. And I don't think that's going to stop here, for instance, for MS-DOS programs. And they all have screenshots. And the reason they all have screenshots is because I have a script that goes and plays the games, takes screenshots, makes the unique ones, figures out which ones are interesting, um, and then creates the screenshot. So you're able to get to these really weird programs. This is an MS-DOS program from 1993 that enables you to figure out what the tides are. It's like a tide app. So you type in, like, oh, it's San Francisco Bay coming up. What's the tide going to be? Like, this is never going to show up again. Like, you're never going to, this is never going to be on the PlayStation Network. It's never going to be on the iOS. It's, this is it. This was its time, its, its glory. And a person who wants to do research can now call it up as if it was a movie or a piece of music. And you lose, you know, there's all these little aspects like, the magic art of how do you do a shadow in a text box? And how do you come up with a set of um, colors to make it look like it's a shadow on this program that nobody wants? <laughs> nobody wants this program. I just want to point that out. I don't want to mislead you. Nobody wants this program. This is a debugger for your 80386 assembly code that you're writing, which is not now. When you see that date, that's just because that's the day I ran it to take the screenshot. That's not when it was written. It was written many years before. And there's one program so far that we have discovered out of the thousands that I've put up that when it runs, notices that it's been a long time since it was written. And it boots up and goes, oh my god, I'm still running 17 years later. And oh man, that paid off it turned out. People are constantly sending me screenshots of it. Did you know it did this? I'm like, yeah, I know it does that. It's, it's joyful, you know? I mean, games are fun. Games are really enjoyable, and so people understand them. But I wanted to show you that there's computers involved. And the thing is, it can be anything. I, I, we can emulate a PDP-1. We can play Space War at the archive. We can run old PCs. We can run old machinery, and it's just going to continue like, this, isn't, this genie's not going back in the bottle. So programs that are written now will have a home in the future and can be accessed and, and dealt with. I just wanted to show you that, you know, one of the more popular areas is the console living room, where we put up 3,000 cartridges from about 30 different systems. And depending on your age, you know, you'll be like, oh, Sega Genesis, Atari 2600. Don't admit you know what that is, but admit what that is. That means you're about 30. And then Sega Game Gear, yeah, about 30. Um, and that's fine. People, some people will know the Bally Astrocade. Some people might know the Magnavox Odyssey 2, the first cartridge, second cartridge-based system. But then you start to get to like other ones, like the Entex Adventure Vision, or the Watara Supervision, a terrible Game Boy clone that came out. And there was one called the, oh, there it is, the Mega Duck WG-108. Didn't sell well. But this one, for instance, four items. This is it. This is the corpus. This is the payoff. Only four cartridges ever came out for the Entex Adventure Vision. This was not the horse to back in the console wars. And the reason why is because it's awful. <laughs> Fundamentally awful. But as engineers, you will appreciate this. It does not have a video screen. 
what it has instead on its floor, on its, on its base, is a set of 40 LEDs and a spinning mirror. And the spinning mirror sends the LED image onto a small piece of plastic. So it constantly spins, and it's basically switching through all of the pixels. And you're like, that doesn't sound like there's going to be a lot of pixels, Jason. No, no, there is not going to be. It's going to be this. <laughs> this is the Entex Supervision playing Defender. But you wouldn't be able to, exp I mean, you wouldn't want to buy one. I could say, go to this URL. Come enjoy the Entex Supervision for the 45 seconds it will take you to hate it and move away. Come browse the many fine selections you have of Defender, Super Cobra, Turtles, and Space Force, and Christmas is over. It's that ability. It's, the un it's what I call non-advocated history. Everybody's going to know who George Washington is. Everybody's going to know Steve Wozniak did the Apple II. Everyone's going to know that Steve Jobs did the iPhone. But you're not going to know about the also-rans, the forgottens, the cool ideas that were too ahead of their time. The, 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 the variations, the weird experiments that failed miserably and spectacularly, or this borderline fraud where, I just imagine the kid opening this thing up in 82. Oh, he could have been a scientist, but uh, no, no, science, science screwed him over. Um, anyway, so where's the future going to go? Well, it's funny, too, because um, I gave a talk with uh, the creator of Ready Player One because I've essentially created the Oasis. And this was the greatest article to come out of that speech because any time, you know, you speak at a public event and then you're like, oh, I hope the press covers it. And it's why are we trying to create Ready Player One's terrifying nostalgia-fueled dystopia? Now you know you're doing great work. Because that's, oh. anyway, I still, uh, you, don't, you don't get newspaper clippings anymore, so I can't put the newspaper clipping up, but I, I keep this around because it just really, I'm like, yes, yes, I in fact am creating a terrifying nostalgia-fueled dystopia. That's a good hobby. Um, what I've done in the future and work, working with people is we've come up with some really weird things that do work. We haven't done them yet because we're finding it's taking a while to ramp up end users into this weird world. Because for instance, what people forget is Windows was really hard to use in 95 and 94 and 93, certainly 85 when it was Windows 1. I mean, it, it, was, it was not easy. And people are very used to things being their buddy now, and they forget how much there is. I mean, yes, there's a rule then, which is make people miserable and show them how it used to be, and let them wipe it away and go to the new thing and be grateful, be a little ingrates, about the way things are now. But so what you're looking at here is a really strange thing. We got Windows 3.1 working in JavaScript. That's nice. And then one of our guys figured out how to create a ersatz PPP connection through a proxy running on a server to emulate a 57K modem that's giving it PPP, which means that this is a Windows 3.1 box running in JavaScript that actually connects to the internet and actually uses browsers and will go to the internet. Now, the internet is not happy about Netscape 1.0 <laughs> on Windows 3.1 visiting it, Many of them are not happy at all. There's a little trick you have to do to remove one flag because it doesn't work on any of them now because of that. Like the web has kind of rejected it. But we can actually get to some pretty good websites now. The Space Jam website still works. A bunch of sites still work, you know, that are pretty good. But just again, this is running in my, this is a screenshot I took on my Windows 8.1 server running a browser. So this is a 2000, sorry, let's get this right. It's a 2015 op, um, um, operating uh, browser sitting inside of a 2013 operating system running a 1993 operating system that is running a 1995 browser in JavaScript in real time. And there's one last thing we did with it, which is not here, was we actually got MAME 1.0 to run on it which means we can run Pac-Man inside of Windows 3.1, which is running inside of MESS, which itself is running inside of a browser, which is running inside of your OS. 
So, okay, the emularity is here. We're here. Now we just have to think about what are the, you know, social and, and whatever aspects to it. Yeah, so here's an interesting thing. I've put up stuff, it got a lot of news. Like, oh, free games at the Internet Archive, which is fine. You do a lot of work. I mean, if, if you've gotten some sense of, like, how powerful this is, um, and yet <laughs> um, people, like, the news will just kind of boil it down to, like, free games. And I'm like, yes, our newly designed Harrier jet delivers pizza faster than everybody else. It can go 100 miles and your pizza will not be cold. Awesome! New pizza delivery system arrives. It's like, yes, that is one of the things it does. When I put up 2,000, when I put up 3,000 arcade games, or I should say console games, that got a certain amount of press of people who were in their 40s. When I put up stuff about arcade games, the actual arcade games, Again, those 40-year-olds who are now writing for things were like, ooh, we can do this. But when I put up stuff from MS-DOS, all of the people who were, there, who were in their teens and 90s are now running all of the websites that have news. So that was the second, the second coming and the third coming in a value pack for these people. So they went nuts that there were all these MS-DOS programs, but even more, they all went nuts that the Oregon Trail was back. And so it sounds like a lot of people who have played the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail is essentially a simulator of you going across to Oregon and dying most of the time. So it's a way to introduce children to almost certain death. And it asks you what you want to be and then makes you miserable and then you die. Kids love it. Since I introduced this on January 2nd of this year, there have been 1.3 million plays of the Oregon Trail off the Internet Archive. And this is from a school that I was sent because social studies classes are now making it part of their curriculum because they can allow the kids to play. And I had one where they told me that, you know, this person told me that they would have one copy and they would have 30 kids around it shouting commands. And now they have it on 20 machines and all of these kids are able to play it. And they are delighted that they're able to play the Oregon Trail and, and play it through. So having old software exist, this is a 1992 program for MS-DOS, instantaneously has really made a difference. So I know this is going to be a big deal. So again, half of this is about you know, activism in terms of the preservation space, but it's also about realizing that data and the work you do has real cultural meaning, has real meaning. The user data has a future. It has a thing that's going to be needing it in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I just started a project that made the news because I'm trying to collect every AOL disk, every AOL floppy that was mailed or CD that was mailed. And people are like, why? And then the other half are like, of course you would do that, because you do this. Um, but it's been interesting, because then I've had people come to me and go, well, I have 2,000 CDs of all sorts. Do you want to have them? Are they important? I'm like, yes, send them along. So people have been sending me all this computer history because I'm doing this dumb AOL stunt. And, and, and so, I mean, it's just you know, providing a way for people to understand why this is important. I hope to some small extent I've given you some idea. Here's an example where there's now a trend, because one of the arguments about emulators is emulators are too perfect, too smooth, and they're on LCD monitors, and there is now effort underway to emulate um, how crappy old monitors are. <laughs> so this is how it would normally look, and then up here is the blur and the, the static and everything else, and it's now, the, they've already done that. They're now to the point that they're trying to emulate specific models. So you can do an RCA Trinitron from 1983, and be able to put your program through it. So, yeah! <laughs> they can do deflection coil noise of the, uh, of, of the speaker of an arcade game. You know, I mean, it, it's happening. It's happening. It's going to be a very interesting time. Until then, I'm trying to now gather up all this material. This is something that somebody sent me. And I'm just digitizing them and putting them online, letting the end leaders run, th run free. And there are so many pieces of our history that were just in danger that I don't think are in danger like they used to be anymore. We don't know what the value is going to be. And here's Douglas Adams and Steve Moretzky, who made a game called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, based on his book. And there were pictures of this thing. They didn't program it on this. They programmed it on this. 
Um, but they had one, so the photographer wanted it, which is why the mouse goes nowhere, and it's not plugged in. This is where you plug in a mouse, but I guess he thought that was ugly. So it, huh. Well, anyway, so there was, there was a picture, but I got my hands on the original slide, and I scanned it at 4,000 DPI, which means I can really go in. And then you're able to see things like pictures of Steve Moretzky's wife, Betty, and you're able to see what comic, you know, shoe that he had and what was interesting him. You can even look on his bookshelf and be able to figure out like what books affected him. So having these artifacts start to help you understand people and start to get, you know, pieces that you know. So having old software, you don't know what the value is going to be until much, 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 much later. There's a, there was a place that used to keep all the pictures of everyone who caught fish in some lake for 50 years. And someone figured out how to correlate all of that data to figure out how much the fish were being affected by the climate. Who knew? It was just a brag wall. Um, but beyond all that, beyond all the way I'm trying to convince you that this is all historically important, there is just a beautiful aesthetic beauty to me about how this old stuff was that I like making accessible again and having people be able to reach out to it and draw from it and be inspired like they might be from the old masters or from Picasso pen drawings or from old newspaper clippings. I think that there's some inherent motions that are brought up in various people, both as they experience it and as people who have never been there. I think that there's this weird sense of how we're gonna solve these problems that now we just think of as solved. Because in some cases, they solved them different ways. And I don't want us to lose the knowledge of how we solved it. But whatever way we do it, and this is a ZX spectrum, um, I think that just having this material around can just you know, really make the world a better place. So, um, ultimately, um, you know, if, I, if, if anything I've said to you at this point <laughs> sticks around, there was that weird story I told you about the meeting that you're going to affect in about five to ten years, um, and I'm also telling you that the work you do in software and the work you do with computers and stuff has ongoing meaning. It's day-to-day might be boring, or you might feel it's irrelevant, or you might be proud of something that nobody else is proud of right now, or you might be really happy something got done. But I'm telling you that we don't know what the later generations will consider important, and what moves you do, and when you're dragged in your 80s to give a talk, because at some point you did some mild thing that nobody even noticed at the time, but it turns out you were the first, and you're the winner, and they want to give you a little award, or they want to ask you, what were you thinking? And you were like, I was thinking lunch was early. I got to get to lunch. <laughs> and that, you know, far from being cold data, uh, we are data, and software as data has meaning in our lives. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. I gave us a resounding nine minutes for Q&A, of which, of course, if you leaf off to actually have lives, I understand, too. But does anyone have any questions or queries or comments? Try not to make it a story about yourself, but I'll, I'll take it. Yes? What kinds of uh, intellectual property issues do you have with uh, collecting all this data? So um, I always get that question. Why are you not in Guantanamo Bay right now? <laughs> um, <laughs> They're clearing out the terrorists. Why isn't it you on your knees? Like, what happened? Oh, my God, Pac-Man. Um, so we're a library. We're a nonprofit. We cost about $12 million a year. We don't have any ads. We're not running some sort of multi-level marketing scheme. We're, we're primarily a library without really a guise of any other aspect. Again, like I said, registered nonprofit, everything else. So we put this material up, and we'll put a lot up. And then somebody will write to us and be like, um, I don't think that should be up. So then we have two questions. Is it yours? OK. If it's not yours, then we're like, thank you. But if it is yours, um, we will take it down, usually within about 15 minutes. And they like that. They're used to a world where stuff goes up, they write to them, the person goes <laughs> and then they have to go through all this garbage to get it down. We'll take it right down. But the question is, you know, at this point in this world of automatic copyright, of endless copyright, truly endless copyright, uh, no book that is copyrighted will automatically become uncopyrighted for the next four years, which you may not know. 
Like any book that's copyrighted right now will be copyrighted at least until 2020, assuming there isn't more legislation passed then. We live in a world of perpetual, endless copyright. And if you ever saw the movie Zardoz, that is a terrible thing to do. If you didn't see the movie Zardoz, don't see the movie Zardoz. Oh my God, it is awful. But one of its central themes was that immortality leads to corruption and misery because there's no chance for renewal, there's no interaction, everything stifles and goes static. So there's software in here that technically is under copyright, but has literally no economic need, purpose, or meaning. Zero. And we don't know which ones those are. And what's going to be, you know, the, the Internet Archive is fundamentally a question. This is how I put this. The question is, what is a library in the 21st century? Is it, a, um, is it an Amazon affiliate that provides you with beautiful Kindle um, books that dissolve after 48 hours? Or is it a living, breathing collection of data contributed by a bunch of people in the world and made as accessible to you as possible, and then seeing where people disagree with you? So, you know, like I said, we put up 1,100 arcade games and 400 have come down, uh, primarily to the 12 companies. And in each case, they were like, well, 11 of them were like, you should take that down, and the 12th one was like, what? <laughs> they were really worried for us. I don't know how to put it. It was like a mob guy going like, you know you don't walk down this street, right? You, you, you're young. It was really funny. I mean, it was very, uh, yeah, rhymes with, rhymes with no friendo. And so <laughs> most of them understood, like, oh, you know, I like the Atari lawyer and I are on first name basis, you know. Hey, Jason. Hi, Kristen. What's up? Um, and it was interesting because I asked that Atari, you know, which ones do you think you own? And they think they own every arcade game up to June of 1984. But they don't know who owns everything after that. So it's everything after that's still up. If you want to play Marble Madness, you're in luck. If you want to play Asteroids, you're not in luck. But there's a game called Uncle Pooh that came out from a company called Diatech from Japan in 1982. And it's about an old man who's in a mine who uses flatulence as a weapon against creatures while grabbing uh, diamonds. Uncle Pooh's future is dim at best, and we will not be seeing Uncle Pooh come out for the Xbox One. But we have it. We have it browsable. You can go try it. You know, that's, that's a thing that exists. Same thing with magazines, with books, with all the rest of the material. So anyway, if the answer is kind of a weird answer, the answer is we try to be responsive, but in the dearth of the acceptance of the idea of orphan works anymore, we have to see where the boundaries are and what's meaningful and everything else. And that's, that's our... We, but I always say, you know, librarians have had it so much harder than me. I mean, yeah, we get occasional angry letters, but I mean, there would be librarians who would be in small towns where, I mean, we're near Kansas. There have been places where people are like, that book should not be here. And the person's like, screw you, the book stays. I'm gonna put it in the front. That's much more brave when you know that like Alice's husband is like the city council leader and Alice is like, take that book away. And you're like, no knowing full well it could cost you your job. That, to me, is a thousand times more braver than making Donkey Kong available for the two months it was up, the glorious two months it was up. Uh, we actually put up the Pauline edition. Does anyone know, anyone know the Pauline edition of Donkey Kong? Um, the Pauline edition was a father had a daughter, and she wanted to know why she couldn't play as the girl. But the girl just sits there while the monkey throws things. And he was like, you're right. And he stayed up all night, and he turned Mario into the girl. And he turned the girl into Mario. And it's called the Pauline Edition. And people have put it into their video games. And we had it up for play for two months. Um, anyway, that's a very long set of them. But that, that, there's a whole bunch of questions that are associated with that. So I always like to just get those done so there aren't any, you know, 1A, 1B. Let me get in, then you. Go ahead. Keep, like, if, when you get, like, a takedown... You, are you able to keep that data, or is it... We have never deleted data? anything. Oh, okay. So, like, you still have it just in case? Sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there are notes on it, like, wait for him to die. <laughs> <laughs> yes? With the uh, amount of software and games that are now moved into the app stores, walled gardens, that sort of thing, sure. how, how do you guys, or can you guys even handle that? How do you archive things that may require 
On the iOS side, it's going to require pirates. Um, on the Android side, there was a group I was dealing with. I'm about to take over the project from them. I didn't have time this week. Um, they have been downloading every version of every app on the Google App Store. So we, are, we already have the first set, so we have like a million and one Google Play Android apps. And um, unfortunately, there's like a one month or two month gap in it, but I think in the, in the grand scheme of things, people will be fine with that as long as we keep the record. Oh yeah, that's one of my most important things, and uh, we only had one takedown for one app, but um, in the future, I don't want to do it now, but in the future, an Android JavaScript or um, there's actually a JavaScript augmentation slash replacement that's underway now called WebAssembly. When that comes out, we will probably convert to WebAssembly. WebAssembly is essentially, wow, JavaScript really worked, but it was terrible and organic. Let's try to redo it. It'll work or it won't. And at that point, you'll probably get native speed in your browser. And there's already Android emulators everywhere. So I am not so concerned with with Android that like in five to ten years we'll boot up Android in your phone and be or the thing there and be like wow this thing's trying to make me pay for this flashlight, um, or or otherwise use a program and see how many people wanted to do breakout and so on. Well, to add to that, how do you? Um, there's so many old mobile uh, platforms, mm -hmm. WebOS and some of the older uh, mobile device systems. Are you guys? working on emulating those as well? So, for instance, there's the Palm OS, um, there's the Newton, um, there's the, um, the T-Mobile Hip Top. Um, well, sorry, what's it called that? I, I, this is, okay, so like, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, there was this other kid I met who was a little older than me, and it was weird, because in like 88, he had a 12 CD changer in his car, which is insane. It's like having a maker bot in your car now, right? And he would collect things like Pixar, he used to make computers, he had one, and he loved robots. So his name was Andy, but everyone called him Android, and his name was Andrew Rubin. And so he ended up creating the Android phone. And along the way, he created the Danger Hip Top, which became the T-Mobile sidekick. And he created all these weird machines and stuff that I'm always like, oh, Andy's thing. Um, all of those are software whose platform I think we'll be able to emulate to some extent. Um, you'll always run into these weird situations and people point out, I don't like the situation where people point out edge cases as reasons why you shouldn't do something. I think that's a very poor technique. You know, like there's like one or two video games that have wires into lights that will come on and they'll be like, well then you'll never emulate the experience. And I'm like, you'll get a lot of the experience you'll get a good amount. You're not there. You know, the example I always give is the fluoroscope. Uh, I just have to know. When I say fluoroscope, who knows what the hell I'm talking about. As life goes on, it becomes harder and harder for people to know what a fluoroscope is. All right. It's okay. It's from the 30s. It's not, you, you didn't miss something. You didn't have your head down and miss something a year ago. The fluoroscope was a gimmick that was used in shoe stores. And what you would do is, to make sure that your shoes fit right, you would put your feet into the fluoroscope and you could see where the bones fit. If this sounds awful, it is. Shoe salesman died. But it was a thing. It was a real thing that existed, the fluoroscope. So how are you going to emulate that now? How do you have people have the experience of the fluoroscope? Do you have a computer screen that when they stick their foot in, it shows bones and it Im imitates as if you would see it? Do you have a dead, non-used, probably inside lead um, fluoroscope that, you know, whatever? Do you rebuild a fluoroscope in plastic using a MakerBot to look like what a fluoroscope looked like and point at it and go, that was a fluoroscope, along with a little plaque? These are going to be our questions in 50 years with video games. How are you going to do Call of Duty? <laughs> How are you going to do a Pac-Man game when there's seven left? And... Um, that's the stuff we're trying to deal with. And so a fluoroscope to me is just the future where we're gonna go. Like, where is this gonna be? And you're not gonna get the experience of being nine years old. And, st you know, I mean, mm. my, one of my favorite facts is that Madame Curie's notebooks are still too radioactive to handle. Um, she used to mail iridium to peers in the mail, and they would write back that the glow was beautiful. 
And now you're looking at it like, you are all going to die. Oh, my God. And, um, and I mean, I've been in, you know, labs where there are pressure chambers. Uh, MIT, I was, I was in a working as a temp, and there was a pressure chamber, and the pressure chamber was used to test some sort of military thing, because MIT was a big military contractor back then. <laughs> and it was explained to me that a number of scientists had died in that room just because they thought this was set, and this wasn't set, and this was set, and it blew up, and they died. And there's a whole history and an experience of that danger and everything, and are we going to just let it disappear? Are we going to put an analog in? This is classic historical stuff. So for me, I'm like, first, rescue the data. Rescue the data. Then try to rescue as much of the experience as possible. Then try to present the experience as well as you can. Then listen to a bunch of people bitch that you, <laughs> that you did every part wrong up to this point. That's where we are. You don't know how to really do Civil War reenactment. Um, any, other any other questions? He, uh, he, he, he was, was first, then you were, okay. Pairs, if it's the same question, I will laugh. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you have any uh, uh, publishers cooperating with you and, and uh, help, helping you archive old versions? Only a very tiny number. Um, like we have made an agreement with the Balinese government that we will digitize all Balinese work. <laughs> Or we will have um, uh, Voyager CD-ROM, who created a bunch of groundbreaking CD-ROMs. They're like, take whatever you want. Walnut Creek is the same way. Any of the old shareware CDs, you know. But like, I don't know. Penguin's not taking us to dinner anytime soon. <laughs> Random House throws eggs at our mailbox. You know, I mean, there's not going to be certain larger publishers that aren't going to do it. But, you know, we, we, we try to maintain what we can with who we can. Um, some of them buy in, some of them don't. I mean, you know, the fact is, most publishers want all libraries to die. And, and there's this weird thing of like, no, they don't. Like, yes, yes, they do. Yes, they do. They could turn every single one of them into a Starbucks and do it in a way that didn't get back to them. They would do it tomorrow, with haste, before lunch. Um, they'd, have, they'd have vinyl banners up in front of, you know, used to be Princeton Public Library, now Starbucks. They would do that. So, and I understand some of it. But I mean, there's also a hostility to we can't let anything get in the way. Um, there's a copyright battle that's currently fought by car companies and by John Deere. John Deere has been using the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act to indicate you cannot work on their engines because of their software code inside. And one of the main reasons they've given is because if hacked properly, it can be used to pirate music. It's a terrible world. Anyway, so that's what, you know, it's kind of an up and down. It'll always be the smaller, more experimental guys who will like to talk to us. The ones who, you know, every single new wave of technology is they're like, whatever. You know, they just weather it. They're like, let's wait for every major player to die and then buy the winner. You know, that's kind of what they're doing. That was how IBM did things, you know. So, your question. Assuming I answered. Mm, Good question. Um, so we have, um, our budget every year is $12 million for everything. That's the people, the equipment, the data use, the everything. Um, we have two for-profit businesses. We will scan books for money, but we, ke we keep a copy of the book and put it up. We don't charge you for access to your book, and we charge like a, like, it's like a penny a page or something, and we'll scan for you. And so that's one of our incomes. The other one is we will do professional top-to-bottom weekly web archiving of your web presence. Um, and we are like 70 or 80% of that market. Um, so each of those brings in a few million dollars. Then we have fundraising drives. And then there's a thing, there's a foundation that gives us money. And it used to be, a, that foundation gave us a lot of money. Now that foundation gives us less money. And I'm working to make it no money. So like this year, I'm gonna run a telethon, see how that works. Um, but I'm always going around trying to get, you know, I helped rewrite the donate page and helped us try to get better donations. Um, but for many years it was a rich man's toy to do something neat. And now there's people who, I mean, our lives are invested in it and we're trying, you know, I'm the one, I blew off the engineering meeting today to, to come speak here because I'm like, I want to get the word out. I want to work on what we're doing and getting the word out instead of a small number of people knowing about us. People either know about us, like a lot of people know us as just the Wayback Machine and Somehow that magically exists, and nothing about any of the other building parts or anything that it does. 
So getting that word out to me is critical. And along with that, we'll hope, I mean, you know, $12 million is like nine Facebook parties. You know, it's not a lot of money in, in, in Silicon Valley, and so few of them even think that we're something they should give money to, you know? So I wish it was more. I wish it was more. I'll, I'll continue to insult them and make them give us money. We'll see if that works. <laughs> Brewster says that he thinks, Brewster has said that he thinks of me, just so we understand, like, how much I'm speaking for the archive, He's like, I look at him like I think the Library of Congress looks at me. You know, like, he's weird. He's a weird kid. Does anyone here know about Pratt keeping? Yes, no. So there's a shot from Jurassic World where Chris Pratt is going like this with three raptors who are coming up on him, okay? And so there's three raptors there, and he's like doing this to get them going. Zookeepers around the world. Uh, this is all about two weeks old, so you're, you can be quite excused for not knowing. Zookeepers around the world started posing with their animals. I mean, walruses, ducks, monkeys, in the same way. You know, and it was great, because it was all these great zookeepers. And now it's moved to not just zookeepers. And I got Brewster to pose in front of our data center like that, with all of our stacks. And bless him, he has no friggin' clue what I'm doing. He has no idea. I'm like, trust me. Trust me, if you go like this in front of your server, he's like, am I praying to it? I'm like, no, no, no. He's like, I'm not doing some weird, you know, Jesus weird thing, right? I'm just doing, and I'm like, yeah, just go like this in front of the server and take a picture. And I did, and it was like 300 retweets and everyone flipping out that there was a, I'm like, Pratt keeping. That's, that's the gulf where I'm like, there's a thing you don't know that's going to be funny, and it'll get your name out. And he's like, okay. Well, I put my foot up. All right. All right, is that what you do? Is that what the kids are doing? Okay. <laughs> this was a guy who worked on, he was the lead chip designer for the Connection Machine in 1983. He was a chip designer through his uh, 20s, and he had worked at the MIT AI lab for um, under Marvin Minsky uh, and... Um, there's another one who's also famous there, and the two of them made these AI machines that were 300 CPU mainframes, and, and, and then in his 50s is some crazy idiot like, pose like this, you're a machine, and he's like, okay, why? Because the Twitters will laugh. So I give him credit for like staying with it. So any other questions? I think we're about the end. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you 